uh, for those of you who come every month, you know that we're doing that every month, presenting a topic of interest uh, in the crypto space, whether that's about interesting projects, some analysis of what's going on in the market or whatever. And it's been 30, 35 months so far we've been doing that. Today we have um, exciting news because uh, we decided to kind of open up this crypto meetup to more people in the community and officially Ivan is joining us to help organize these things. Just a couple of words about him. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know him, he's been into crypto investing for what, like a couple of years already. As he said himself, he's a shitcoin survivor. So, yeah, he, he basically managed to, to stay afloat after all booms and busts. And now he's working in Nexo, uh, which is one of the more um, sort of, uh, how to say, well-known and uh, successful Bulgarian crypto projects with a successful IP ICO of a 50 million plus. And um, he, he would basically you tell a little bit more about what you do there. And he will today present uh, basically the the analysis of the crypto market that we do every every time. And then he'll tell a bit about uh, what's going to happen in the presentation, who's going to present, and uh, basically a bit about topic. So I'll give the floor to Ivan, give him another shout, and yeah, cheers. Hey guys uh, and girls, I'm Ivan. I'm part of Nexo since November last year. I do institutional products over there, but since no one here is an institutional uh, client. I'm not going to bore you with what I do there. Uh, I'll jump right into the top headlines for the month. So as, as it's customary for the group, we do a poll. And uh, those are the, the five things that people said are the most important events from the past month. I mean, some of them are from January, but uh, yeah. Because the, the, the January uh, meetup was dedicated entirely to Eternity and their mainnet, uh, we didn't have a, a chance to cover what's, what, what has happened. So yeah, we'll just start with corporate coins. Uh, <laughs> uh, so come for the returns, stay for the memes, as we all know. Uh, so yeah, for some reason, uh, people get very excited when, when, when big companies and household names do something, no matter what, on the blockchain. Uh, without a doubt, the biggest uh, headline was, was JP Morgan launching their own coin. Uh, some people were questioning, why is this news worthy? Uh, because it basically, so basically they're doing a stable coin on a private chain that's uh, based on Ethereum. So that has very little to do with with the public blockchains most people embrace and uh, speculate on. Uh, and you know, the, the one thing that's uh, quite evident from there is that re remittance, meaning like cross-border payments, remains the main uh, use case. Uh, another big one was Facebook. So basically they've been hiring quietly for at least five months. Uh, so they're ramping up blockchain expertise internally. Uh, and in February, they acquired, acquired, meaning basically they bought chain space because of the expertise of the, the team. Uh, and the rumor is that they will be looking for identity implementations, uh, although some people say that there, there's going to be an internal payment token. Uh, two other things that sort of made the headlines, not so much. Samsung uh, integrated uh, storage, like private key storage in their uh, new uh, flagship phone. So EA adoption. And Opera, which is like a top five browser, uh, in their next iteration they will have uh, integrated in-browser wallet, sort of like you have in, in Brave, for example. Uh, Rabbit BTC, my favorite part. So basically, this is like a ERC20 clone of Bitcoin. Uh, the Bitcoins are held by BitGo, so it's not entirely decentralized by any means. Uh, but basically, yeah, it's, it's, it's a Bitcoin rep representation on the Ethereum chain. It's a bridge that should 
be a part-time solution or like a temporary solution until, until cross-chain interoperability reaches scale. And the reason why I like it so much is because the, the, the first uses will be within the decentralized finance uh, or decentralized open finance, DopeFi, uh, which is pretty dope. Uh, project. So uh, some of the things that will be done with, with the RAV BTC is to be used as collateral to borrow DAI from uh, MakerDAO through the MakerDAO protocol, whatever. Uh, uh, and like it's been quite sort of quietly growing for, for the past few months and it, there's a lot of buzz around it. Basically 2% of all Ethereum is locked uh, for the purpose of creating DAI which is a uh, US dollar pegged stable coin. Uh, lending borrowing on Dharma Lever, which is a uh, yeah, uh, decentralized lending protocol marketplace. And something else that's interesting is uh, smart contract portfolios, meaning you can basically buy a basket of tokens and do that in an automated manner. You feed in one Ethereum and then like, it pro proportionally buys whatever basket you've defined and RAP BTC allows for that. Yeah. Uh, ETF drama, again. Uh, so basically on 22nd of January, uh, CBOE withdrew the, the ETF application that was pending and that was perceived to be the most likely to be accepted. Main reason naturally was the shutdown of the US government which lasted for a very long time and like everybody was, okay, basically, because of the, of the delay, there is no time for SEC to issue a statement with a deadline. So to avoid rejection, they just basically withdrew the application. A few weeks later, they, they resubmitted it. Everybody was like, yeah, overreacting about it in, in, in Twitter and 4chan and, and what, whatnot. Uh, the market didn't move much. So yeah, uh, Hester Pierce became again the favorite person of, of, of everyone in crypto. Uh, she, she, she gave a speech right after that saying that uh, an ETF approval is very likely. And uh, you might have heard her name before because basically she was uh, the person that questioned the rejection of the Winklevoss brothers uh, ETF. Uh, so yeah, that currently there is another one uh, on the table. So 11th of February, Bitwise and, and uh, Arca submitted another proposal, so there are two ETFs under consideration at the moment. Uh, Lightning, Lightning Network. Uh, so there's, there's been a lot of interesting stuff happening there for, for quite some time, but uh, this month they basically exploded with uh, three very cool things that had very high visibility, which I think was the whole point. So the first one was the Lightning Torch. Basically, the idea is uh, you receive a, a payment through the, through the Lightning Network and you can either back the money or you can add uh, 10,000 Satoshi and pass it along. Like, pretty much every high profile name in, in the crypto space uh, has been through this now, including uh, Hoffman, the, the co founder, the, the founder of, of LinkedIn. Now it's with Fidelity, which is basically the biggest asset manager in the world. Uh, and there is a cap of 2.2 BTC. So it's going to get currently, like, the value is around. $120 of what's in the torch. So basically nobody's gonna bag it, right? But it's gonna get interesting once it, it reaches this 2.2 Bitcoin. Uh, if someone's gonna steal it or if it's gonna reach the cap and then go to Venezuela for charity. Uh, tip in me, those are the guys who actually initiated the torch and it, m the thing might be connected because the torch is, is, is distributed, it's, being popularized through Twitter. So tipping now is integrated with Twitter and you can basically, through the Lightning Network, tip tweets that you really like. Like if the like is not enough for you, you can send money to the person who wrote it. And my personal favorite is the Lightning Network pizza. Basically you can, you can, you can buy pizza from Domino's in the US uh, and you get 5% 5, 5 discount. That's about it. Uh, I mean, there are a bunch of other things, like the, the first one was Stoshi's Place, but those are the ones that 
made the headlines this past month. Oh yeah, so, so this is a bit of a, like a sort of a, an a announcement slash news. So Andreas Antonopoulos is coming to Sofia for Digitalk this year, which is really cool. Uh, so he's basic, I, I mean, I, I say one of the most notable, but I, I, for me personally, he is the most notable proponent of, of Bitcoin. Uh, he's written like two of the best-selling books on the topic, uh, Internet of Money and Mastering Bitcoin. He also wrote Mastering Ethereum. And yeah, he's, he's been speaking all over the world. Uh, a lot of people from the local community have gone uh, to other countries to listen to him. And now we have a chance in, in, in the end of May to, to see him in Sofia, which is pretty cool, I think. The workshop is not confirmed yet. Yeah, like there, there's likely going to be a workshop as well, but he will ha st certainly have a keynote. Yeah. That's that's pretty much it. Maybe Evo want to hop for the for the price feed, or should I go? Oh, yeah. So basically, this is uh, so for every crypto meet, Sofia crypto meetup we've had so far, we just put a put a a, a dot where the price is on the date of the of the event. Uh, since this is my first time here on stage, it was pretty interesting because. Basically, because in December, everybody has something better to do than to, to talk about cryptocurrencies. So we actually missed the peak. And the highest point we have is, <laughs> is around, was that 11.5? Yeah. And the, the other one. How the price was going for both. Yeah, this is for both uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And as you can see, like, we started when the price was very low. This is really correlates to how many people come in these, in these events, by the way. And uh, yeah, Bitcoin is kind of stabilizing, which is great, in my opinion. Uh, I remember back, when was it, like 2016 here, like it stayed for that long, sort of more or less on the same level. I think it's going to be like that here as well. We'll see. You never know. But the Ethereum is really, that's that sort of Ethereum. It tells you something, you know, it tells you something. <laughs> but anyways, that's, that's just something like a nice visualization of, uh, of what's, gonna, what's happening in the price during the crypto meetups. So yeah, that, would you like to introduce the... the, the so yeah, basically, uh, it was my idea to bring the guys over because... Uh, they're gonna tell us basically how 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 uh, traditional fiat world is being bridged with the Ethereum blockchain, and my first thought was okay that that's that somehow relates to to decentralized finance, DeFi, my favorite topic. Let's get them to speak. Uh, so yeah, we, we we have the guys from uh, LimeChain to to tell us about their new product, which it's not a sales pitch. It's I, I think the the what they're doing is actually fascinating. That's why they're here, right? They're not here to. To sell. I'll speak so that we skip the awkward part where we are switching uh, the presentations. But while we are starting, I'm George, this is Daniel, and how many of you don't actually know who we are? Please raise your hand. Okay, so a lot of people don't know who we are. So um, we're both part of uh, LimeChain, and LimeChain is. Uh, company that started around two years ago with the sole purpose to develop blockchain applications. Uh, and through this time, we have actually uh, developed a lot of applications and seen a lot of different use cases and seen a lot of different problems. And the talk that I'm going to give you today is on a recent journey that we have started. And it is, all of this is coming out of, uh, out of the necessities that we have seen in the different dubs that we have had the chance to work with, had the chance to talk with, or just to, to, to observe them. And uh, this is called uh, LimePay. And as Ivan said, this is not going to be a sales pitch. And this is not even uh, like finance education or something. More or less, this is user experience and adoption uh, talk and through this talk I'm going to drive like take you through a journey tell you why I believe that 
DAPS adoption is not extremely high, or we're going to see how high it is actually. And we're going to t tell you like how we believe this can be solved and actually demonstrate to you how we actually think we can solve this. And we truly believe that LimePay can become the de facto solution for solving adoption into DAPS. I know this sounds bold, but you guys are going to see what we have in, in mind. So, the... Yep. I think, I think we made it work previously. Yep, it's good. We're good. Um, so, uh, all of, uh, like, the, the, the topic of this presentation is executing Ethereum transactions with fiat money. First question, why is it only Ethereum? We hope that soon it's not going to be only Ethereum, but Ethereum is very good proving ground because there are, compared to other networks, a lot of dApps that are going to be willing to use what we have here. And what we have here, well, let's talk a little bit about dApps adoption. So, how many of you have used at least one dApp themselves? Raise your hands. Okay, most of you. How many of you have used two dApps? Raise your hands. How many of you have used three dApps? Okay, and <laughs> I'll, I'll get there, I'll get there. We're going to get there. And what are dApps? Decentralized applications based on a blockchain. All right, cool. And okay, how, how many of you have used like five dApps? Okay, so you see that this progresses uh, like quite nicely into, into a lower scale. And how many, exactly the same question, how many dApps does, so uh, Joru, you said that you're using more than five dApps. How many dApps are you currently using? Not just try it, but you're using. Okay, so two dApps. Why am I using, asking you about this? Because what, like one of the most influential talks that I have been, happened last year in Berlin by a guy known, uh, called Alex van der, van der Sand. He is actually the fourth person that has entered Ethereum Foundation. He's like one of the godfathers of, of Ethereum. He's a UX designer and he was giving us uh, this talk on, okay, what is actually the current onboarding and UX process of dApps and who is actually going through this process? And I tried to actually find the answers to this. So I have gone to this very nice site called dapp.com and there is a ranking page there where they list how many daily active user different dApps have based on different categories and what is their community. By community, I mean how many people are in their Telegram, how many people have liked them on Facebook, are tweeting at them, I have like followed them in Twitter. So let's run this thing. So I'm specifically talking about Ethereum, but who wants to guess how, how much, what's the percentage of people that our community of uh, the top three gambling dApps, and how what's the percentage that actually use these dApps? So how many have liked them, and how many are actually using them? Who wants to guess? Any number? How many? What's the percentage? What's the ratio between people that are using the top three? Ethereum gambling dApps compared to their community, like whoever has followed them on Twitter, Facebook, yeah. How much do you think it is? 1%, let's see. And 2%, you're wrong, you're, you're too conservative. <laughs> uh, bearish, too bearish. Let's do the same thing. Games, games are probably the highest adoption rate in, uh, in, uh, in the dApps. Who want, do you want to, to try again? Why is so bearish? <laughs> Okay, let's, let's try again. Dex is, do, we don't have the guys from Waydex, but anyone else that wants to try? Or 1% is good? 8%? Sorry, 1% was good <laughs> this time. You should have sticked. <laughs> and, well, I have taken the top trees based on daily active users and compared with their communities based on this, this site here. So we can, you can later check this data. But, most used DEX, I'm not sure which one is this. I, I, I don't remember. I, I saw so many dApps while we're preparing this, so not really sure. F like strolling through this, finance, 2%. This uh, one is very interesting. Social, 2%. Tooling, 
something that is very dear to me, like uh, how many people are actually using some tools that are going to help them like augment their, their experience. And this was actually a shocker to me, 0.3%. So all of this, as you can see, in the highest thing that we have had is actually 5%. And reverting back to this talk that, that I told you is very influential to me, the question there was, why is it actually like this? And we believe it's because of these guys. And because they are, first of all, a long journey for the regular user to go through. So as a regular user, what you, what you need to do is, first of all, go to, I don't know, Coinbase. Let's take Coinbase, for example. Plug in your money, take some myth. Where do you take your read? Well, you do a MetaMask, let's say, because you would want to interact later. OK, let's install uh, a plugin. Then, or you use my Ether wallet. And this is in the case where you just want to use Ether in these dApps. What if there is a usage of tokens? Well, you need to go to an exchange, go through KYC of this exchange, send some Ether or money, get these tokens, get them out of this exchange, put them in MetaMask, and then if you have gone through all of this, and this normally can take up to days, it's not like a matter of seconds or minutes, then you're good to go ahead and use the dApps that are to be used. So I called, pretty much called this the, 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 the five circles of dApp of DAP user health. So the same things that I told you, like something is new to you, you go to Coinbase, you go to Exchange, you deal with wallet, what actually is wallet, and then you interact. And the survivors are actually DAP users, and they profit from the, from, the, from the DAPs. And my opinion and our opinion is that this is very troublesome for a regular fork that is in the web point to, uh, inter in, like world to do all of this. People don't care. And they just want like the easiest fix possible, and they don't want to spend like three days going through different exchanges. Coinbase, wallets, what is actually a wallet? Do you know how hard it is to actually explain what a wallet is? Everyone thinks that this is wallet. And they, explain, they, they expect that there is actually the same thing in the crypto world, that it's something that you take away with you and you open it and do stuff. How hard is it to, for, for us to tell them that this is actually keys and you need to like have uh, mnemonic to back it up, and why can't you like reset it or stuff like this? It's so, so hard. So what we propose is to actually stop inventing the new X, simplify what we currently have, simplify MetaMask, simplify going to, to Coinbase, and actually use something that is well known to the users. This is what, how we think that we can fix the adoption problem. We think that people want to benefit from dApps because blockchain obviously gives benefits, but they cannot use it because they don't want to go to the three days journey of, of, the, of the DAP user and through the five circles of hell of the DAP user. So what can be done? Let's enter line pay. This is the journey that I, that, 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 that I just described to you. It's going for uh, George, that's me, obviously. Without biceps, with a hair, but doesn't matter. And uh, so I won't, I won't go through the 11 steps but George wants to just buy a t-shirt through a DAP and he has to go through all these steps. And with Lime Pay, we propose to do this just in, a, in, in two steps. George just inputs their uh, credit card and they get delivered the service or product of the, of the DAP. And what is actually Lime Pay? Well, Lime Pay is a SaaS platform that enables end users to execute Ethereum transactions through the use of credit cards. Again, Asterix, hopefully soon we will not be only on Ethereum. And what you can do with, with uh, YPay? Well, example, real examples of things that, that you can do this. Actually, the first thing, thing is actually live on mainnet, and you can do this with, with LimePay. Well, you can pay to store your IP on the blockchain. So let's say that you invent like this very genius thing, I don't know, half bike or something like this. And what you do, you take this idea, you put it on the blockchain, and later when you like want to patent this out, you just reference it. And blockchain is a perfect, ex a perfect example for this because you can prove when you came up with the thing, you can prove exactly what you came up with the thing, and nobody can actually argue with this. So blockchain is good for that. But let's think about it. Who are the users of something like this? Inventors? How many, I won't swear, Fs they give about crypto, in your opinion? 
in my opinion, it's around zero or maybe around the uh, adoption rate of the tooling, 0 0.3. And the other users of this DAP are actually uh, IP lawyers. They give even less. So this is something that probably need, can benefit from Web.2 user experience. Another thing that you can do, you can make a flight reservation. Another thing that you can do, something that we are currently integrating with, you can buy a ticket to a conference. And this ticket can be a non-fungible token. And people don't need to bother about going through all of this if they want to go to a conference. They just can just put their credit card information there, buy it, execute the blockchain transactions, and all is going to go through. What Lime Pay does? Well, it enables dApps to, receive, dApps to receive fiat, creates crypto proofs, enables generic e-commerce experience, and provides additional UX tools. I know that by now you probably are very confused by all that, uh, that I'm thinking, you just want to see it working. So before I continue with all of this, I would love for Daniel to just show you how all of this works, because you won't believe how much we are not talking about wallets, how much we are not talking about Ether, how much we are not talking about tokens, and how much we're just talking about like money, yeah? It's not even that. So we just... Like nope. Let, let, let us show you the demo. Let us show you the demo and, and you'll know, but we very purposefully don't, don't act as an exchange. We just allow people to execute their blockchain transactions. All of this is coming from their wallets. You'll see the demo now. I, I, I'm, I'm, we're going to give you the demo of the thing that, is, uh, I just, that I just described to you with time stamping your uh, intellectual property, like your invention on the blockchain. We're going to show you exactly this. And do you want to ask your question now or after the demo? Is it related? Sorry? Let me answer to this after the demo when we get to what is LimePay good for. There you go. Okay, so hi guys. Um, I'm going to show you what the UX of uh, DAP looks like that have integrated LimePay in it. So I don't think I can work this out. <laughs> it doesn't look so good. So basically, VoteYouth is a platform where you can upload your intellectual property, as George said, and um, after that, you can go to court, and with all the, uh, the tools, you can prove that you've actually owned the intellectual property. So um, as George said, the users of the DAP won't be crypto savvy. They, won't, uh, they don't want to know about crypto, etc. They just want to publish their intellectual property. So uh, I'm just going to demonstrate you how that will work. So I'll create a simple intellectual property that, just a second. This is some um, business uh, logic of the DAP. So I'm going to upload uh, my invention, which is a, a cube or something like that. I'm going to accept the terms and conditions, etc. So, yeah, um, up until uh, so far, we don't uh, uh, so wine pay at all. So we're presented with uh, two ways to pay with uh, credits, which are basically ERC-20 tokens. But um, we're not interested in, interested in that case uh, uh, now. We want to pay with credit cards, so we have uh, the reg regular... Um, Billing information, the total amount, the VAT, uh, the the street, zip, etc. I'm just gonna enter some test uh, credit card. Let me do the talking while you enter this. So yeah, wh why why are, why are we using this? Well, because it's a brand new account and we don't have any crypto inside. So we haven't gone to Coinbase, we haven't bought anything, we haven't gone to. Uh, I don't know, any exchange, we haven't bought tokens, so this is a brand new account that has like zero tokens, zero ether, they just want to timestamp their thing on the blockchain, and they don't have 
the, the, like the cryptos to do that, but they have credit card and they're willing to pay with this credit card $42. So let's see what's happening. Okay, so I'm typing my password here, but I'm gonna explain why, why I'm required to do that later. So um, once I've typed my password, I can confirm the payment. The payment is sent uh, to WinePay to be proce processed. And um, while we're waiting for that, so the password that I've, I've entered was actually a password that's, that is unlocking their, uh, their wallet, their uh, signing the transactions, so all of this stuff uh, uh, in the background. The user doesn't even know what uh, transactions are, but he's signed them so that he can uh, um, successfully publish the intellectual property. So uh, we can see that our uh, invention is uh, pending. So um, here is my Ethereum address, and I'm gonna show you uh, what's happening behind the scenes. The normal user do doesn't have to do this at all. I'm just gonna show you um, what's actually happening. So just a second. And by the way, I didn't spend 42 dollars for the demo. <laughs> so this is running on Robsten. Uh, currently, we're waiting for, for transactions to come up here. So we, we see that there's uh, the first transaction. Anyone who know how ERC-20 token transfers work know that uh, in order for uh, DAP to, to charge you with some tokens, you need to approve them first. So the first one is the approve. Uh, here, the, basically me as a DAP user approves that the DAP will charge me with tokens. You can, you can see that this is my actual address in the in the DAP. So uh, the from address is the same as my uh, address in the DAP. So my my wallet is executing those transactions. And um, once the first one uh, goes through, uh, we can see that there was a second one. Um, and that's actually the, the business logic of the DAP. Um, this is a transaction that published my intellectual property. And I've um, transferred the, those credits, those uh, ERC-20 tokens to the DAP, and I've paid my intellectual property. But um, all of this is hidden from the user. The user doesn't see anything, uh, any, 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 any re Ethereum-related stuff. And um, we can see that my intellectual property was uh, successfully published. So, yeah. So, Pretty much, this is it. So, I want, I want to add one thing. Let's imagine that I'm a Web 2.0 user. What I just saw was something that I have seen where? In Amazon or eBay. I type in my address, I typed in my credit card. I was asked to type in my password, doesn't matter. Facebook's asked me every time that I want to change like some, something. So, it's not something that I haven't seen as a Web, web 2.0 user. And in a minute, I got what I was looking for. I got my service of the DAP here. So I now have my invention, or Danny has his invention put on the, on the blockchain. Things that we did not see. We did not see tokens. We did not see Ether. We did not see um, wallet. We saw transactions just because we wanted to showcase to you transactions, but I, as a Web.2 user, this would not have gone through, uh, through the hassle and figuring out, all right, this is my address, I'll go to, to Robston to just uh, see what, what transactions are going on there. I did not need to do that, so we did not see any transactions. But what we saw is me paying with credit card and me being rendered a service that is blockchain-based. So this is line pay. This is driving adoption. This is the user experience that folks, regular folks from Web 2.0 are used to, know how to do, apply to Web 3.0, uh, like wor workings, environments, and being able to, to see everything. And by the way, we send, uh, like, the DAP sends invoices, LimePay allows the DAP to send invoices, so all of this is, like, accountable, so don't worry about your accounting. We're sending invoices, you can, like, uh, issue them. This is what, what uh, line pays is. Let's, let's switch to the demo. I'm going to answer some questions now, and we might go ahead later. Yeah, to the presentation. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking this because it's exactly not like this. <laughs> so, no, 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 I know, it, and it is supposed to look like this. This is why it's, uh, it's a more sophisticated platform. I'll tell you why, what are the evidence it's, it's not like this. I could not have executed the transactions from the user's wallet. We could not, could not have uh, done this. So LimePay actually is a cryptographical proofs platform. What we do, and let me ask you to answer you to the question of where does liquidity comes from? We don't go to an exchange and buy this. We actually ask the dApps to provide their own liquidity. We put a smart contract, very special smart contract. How many of you have heard about meta transactions? Okay, cool. So uh, what we do is we put a special smart contract, liquidity contract that is based on meta transactions. Meta transactions is a very interesting term in the Ethereum space where you're able to like uh, take a cryptographical evidence from one party that is signed by their wallet, put it to a smart contract, allow, allow the smart contract to recognize that this was actually signed by the correct user, therefore performed certain actions. So we place this special smart contract that is able to recognize these signed messages and we put it onto the blockchain and we ask the DAP to actually put some liquidity there, some tokens, some ether. This smart contract is only controlled by signed messages that are signed by the DAP. So it's not LimePay that signs this, it's not LimePay that goes somewhere. LimePay does something else. So we request two cryptographical evidence from the two parties that are actually part of this transaction. First cryptographical evidence is the signed message from the DAP that is going to later release some tokens somewhere. Second cryptographical evidence that we request is actually a signed transaction or transactions from the user that when broadcasted, if the user has enough ether and tokens are going to go through. And this is actually where the magic happens. LimePay is not liquidity provider, it's not DEX integration, it's not exchange integration. It's a cryptographical platform allowing the DAP and the user to submit to each other cryptographical evidence and whenever we have the two cryptographical evidence, which, by the way, are independently executable by us, but we don't have any control over them unless they are signed, when we have these two cryptographical evidence, we are actually very, very fine to charge the card of the user, take some money, give it to the dApps, because we are not, like, the dApps are the providers of this, uh, of this service, and then exercise the two, just a second, exercise the two cryptographical evidence, which is going to release the tokens in ETH into the user's wallet, broadcast the transactions that are going to, in essence, put them back. The, put the tokens in ETH back into the, into the DAPS custody. So tokens and DAPS in its essence actually now become a traceability too. This is why you can see everything that we are doing. Coming from the user's wallet, it's all traceable, for Voltitude, it's very important to be traceable because otherwise you cannot prove that you are the one that, uh, that, that have actually timestamped this intellectual property on the blockchain. Let's imagine this was coming from some strange shared LimePay wallet. The only thing that we could have proven is that LimePay was used for this. So this is why, why it's very important for, for this to be coming from the, from the user's wallet. And this is the essence of how, how all of this works. I'll tell you a little bit later about some limitations, but I know that there are some more questions. So go ahead. Does my bank see as like the the entry? Like like who, who is charging my card? I'm putting in the data. It's the data. Okay. Have, have, have you guys had so but this is important. So have you guys had any experience? Because um, yes. many, many banks, when they see like a crypto business as the charge er, say no. But we're not gonna so, so you, you guys are doing everything well, it's just like, I'm just asking like, whether you've experienced banks saying hey, this is crypto, we're not, we're not going to authorize this charge. Yes. Um, 
this is a very good question. Most of the banks are afraid of services or DAFs or like uh, transactions related to crypto dealings. However, and this is why we have certain limitations of LimePay, and LimePay is limited to working with DAFs that offer services and, or products. So what they actually see, and this is what is written on the invoice, and this is what is written on the transactions, is actually rendering the service. So with Voltitude, it's actually putting intellectual property on the blockchain. With the ticketing staff, buying a ticket. We have integrated now with a platform that is for a free, freelance platform where people can actually uh, like apply for, like, for a work or post a job offering for, for a work. What, the, what is there is actually application for a, for a whopper. What we do not do, and we're going to come to this in a, in a second, is actually we do not do a crepe fiat, uh, direct fiat to crypto swap. This is something that we are not allowed to do, and we believe that this is something that there are other companies that are going to do, but these are exchanges. LimePay is not an exchange per se. It's a UX and adoption enabler allowing the DAP to allow their users to execute their transactions without worrying the ether and, and tokens that are there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This way, only if the DAP is storing your private key, because otherwise you have to have wallet again. Yes. So, what is needed is for a signed transaction by the user. How is this transaction signed? Doesn't really matter. What we have shown you here is something, probably the greatest user experience that you can have in a, in a DAP. Of course, you can do the same thing. You're supposed to be able to do the same thing with MetaMask. Unfortunately, MetaMask is not great in integration with, with stuff, but you can do the same thing with Trust Wallet, and you can do the same thing with uh, Ledger Nano. What we have shown you, and a lot of DAPs have expressed interest, is these in-DAP wallets that we showed. I can tell you a little bit later how all of this works. I want to go through the, like my previous things so that because a lot of these questions are answered there. Yeah? Yes. Are you located in Bulgaria? Yes, worldwide. Some of these I have already answered in the presentation. Cool. Uh, we showed you what, what LimePay does. It's exactly these four things. It's a crypto proof platform. I think we made this clear with explanation of how this works. It enables dApps to receive fiat, provides additional UX tools. This is the wallet things that uh, Milan was asking me, and enable generic e-commerce UX experience. You saw something that you will see in, uh, Amazon, in Amazon. None of this is false claims, as you have seen. Um, I won't go into any more details into this. I could, but I won't now. And uh, what line pay is not, again, something that I just told you. We are not a crypto exchange, so you cannot have the end product of all of this is like me receiving tokens. 
or it or something like this. It has to be a product or service for now. Probably upon uh, like correct integrations and correct uh, licensing, which we don't have in our MVP product, we will be able to do this, but for now it is not something that we are. How it works? Okay, I showed you all of this, I told you all of this. Um, and what do we work with? There's the 20 tokens, DAPS ICO uh, tokens, their own ICO tokens. Uh, what we want to soon work with, yeah? I can take part in ICO, even no. if, if they don't have a uh, uh, fiat gateway, like through Lightning? No, uh, what I mean by this is does it have ICO? I want to. Uh... ICO has some utility into their dApps. Uh, the reason for why we work with these two is purely legal. We can work, technically, we can work with any of these. Uh, the thing is that dApps that have the, had ICO, they have the correct. Um, like legal documents that are there in order for this to be legal transactions. For private ERC20 tokens, there is no problem. Just a second. Things that we want to soon be able to work with are public ERC20 tokens like DAI. I truly believe that DAI is actually something that is going to be the future of payments into DAPs because it's stable. And ETH, some DAPs still want to just use plain ETH and because of the ICOs are in vast decline. I don't think that many people are going to be creating their own tokens or at least utility tokens for the time being. And that move for somehow. <laughs> okay, yeah. What is preventing you from using public ERC twenty or or is is that legal mostly or is it? Yeah, it's like we can technically say it seems like it would Oh, that's what goes on the map, the transactions. So, yeah, um, it's certain jurisdictions what consider an exchange. So there are certain legal things that we need to like um, adhere to, like pretty much license ourselves before we are able to operate legally. We can definitely do this now. We're going to be operating in a gray area, but we don't want to. Who is discovered by? Blockchain, obviously, yes. Maker backed us into this. They, they saw a potential uh, into into the design to, to, to back us. And what are the milestones? Pretty much all of this is completed. The, the, the final thing that we want to do is like, like by the end of the uh, summer is to be enabled in the last slide that I showed you to be able to work with. Here's like any years 20 and ETH because we don't want to be forcing like the business models that are not, not there for for us. And yeah, pretty much, pretty much this is it. And there were a couple of questions. Uh, let me just answer charge chargebacks once, and I'm going to get back to you. I won't forget. Uh, chargebacks and refunds. Interesting uh, territory. Uh, refunds. Probably the easier solution. Our, we are actually asking the DApps to work with, uh, to, to put in their terms and conditions that their services and products are not refundable, therefore, no reference obligation. Chargebacks are pretty much uh, our payment processing partner uh, that we work together with, uh, have like numerous um, like layers of defense against this, like credit card debt. Uh, like delays before uh, everything goes through, etc., etc. Like freezes of stuff and liquidity, and some liquidity in order to be able to, to avoid chargebacks. Of course, there are certain cases that some, someone is going to get, get hurt, like any e-commerce, uh, e-commerce non referred refundable debt. So in this sense, in this sense, we're not better than what Amazon and eBay is, but I dare to say we're not worse than that. Yes, but. But it is still once it's on the blockchain, you can't reverse the file if Amazon says, oh wait, like, this is an invalid transaction, I'm not going to ship it, or, or maybe they have, of course they have solutions where they already ship the product. Exactly, like, this, this, is, this is the case for you. Uh, but still, it's an interesting question because then, uh, and I'm 
sorry, follow up question that you said. So it's a DAP, it's decentralized yet. You're saying if you want to do your DAP, so you actually sign a contract with someone putting their terms of services, so they're still a centralized site, they're still an entity you sign a contract with, I'm assuming that so, so, so the DAP is really uh, the DAP part uh, lives on the blockchain and might be decentralized, but there's still an entity behind you that's partners with you that is watching all of this. And you could potentially also solve the charge back if it's not entirely decentralized or have like ways to say, hey, the river so it's taking $10 or whatever. So, I'm uh, sorry, so, so, so the, the question here is how do you work? Do you work with DAPs that don't even have legal legs in the behind, or do you only work with someone who represents uh, no, operates? No one without legal legs can actually receive money. Well, that's not entirely true, but. Uh, well, yeah, you can be a physical person, but right, you need right, somebody right. to be representing this. Right, right. Yeah. So, if you want to be receiving money or charging money for this, you need to be some representation, like a physical person or a legal entity. And another thing, KYC and L. We are required to perform KYC and L on our DAPs, and this is something that is uh, that's important in order to like secure to all the, the legal stuff. So, although we are providing uh, UX experience, like better UX, UX experience to the users, this comes in the expense of the apps that you're working with, they actually, we perform KYC on that, which is still much better because we just do one KYC on, on the app and the rest is... Yeah, it's it's to, 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 to know if someone wants to work on the to do these things, even to design their apps, because I'm guessing a lot of people already have apps, they may not be in a position where they can actually partner with you, they might not be able to reach this to but we, we currently have not seen a DAP that does not have a legal entity. We have, does not have a legal entity. So we have spoken over the last month with I think 35 different DAPs. All of them have a, have a legal legal entity in some way or what it's already in practice. All of them have a business model and want to earn money at the end of the day. So there are businesses. Ivan, sorry, do, do you have more questions? I can get back to you later. So uh, a couple of questions. First of all, uh, non-fungibles. Like, are you gonna support that at some point? Can I buy a crypto kitty with my credit card, basically, <laughs> at some point? Uh, first and second, you said basically you asked for the DAP to provide the liquidity. Yeah. Like, what's what's gonna be the requirement there, and how do you see that scaling? In the sense of if you have thousands of users and like millions in transactions, what would be the requirement on the side of the DAP to Locking basically Ethereum and their native token to to provide this 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 service. Interesting thing is the tokens are actually just circulating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but still, like, like, you need so sort of in essence, so in essence, you just take them from a smart contract, put them in the user, and immediately put them back in the smart contract. So there is not a huge actual demand for this. Uh, Ether, you have probably bigger demand, but still, with it's just for the transaction fees. So you will be probably good to do uh, that, and always you you like earning money from all of this. So therefore, you can always subsidize something inside. But literally, the tokens are like they have no no liquidity issues with this because they immediately move from the from the DAO into the user and back into the DAO. If they just leave the trail, which is very cool, but they just like leave the trails. It's not like literally a payment. The payment actually is happening. Should be for outside. Yeah. The NFT team. The NFT team. Uh, this is interesting. Um, today we were asked whether we are going to be able to support this. Uh, I don't have an answer to this yet. Personally, I see no problem for this because you're pretty much buying a product. But I haven't yet put this to our like this department and everything that's there. So I don't want to like. Then you know, yeah, it's good to tomorrow somebody like swaps and there is said, right? No, we don't do this. So, that's TBS. Okay. Uh, got my question. Uh, okay. okay, can I ask you one more time? Do you remember it? Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, okay. cool. Uh, your question was whether I'm going to be able to participate in ICO. Uh, yes, we will like to pay. The answer is no. We cannot, we cannot do this. This is the straight. Yeah, to, to crypto. So it's only for current active dApps? Yes. Oh, but the, the future of dApps are probably not going to be nice. Here, so okay. more important is to have dApps than that. What about speed? What about speed? 
For example, I'm playing some centralized game and I count on speed execution, probably a betting game or something more sophisticated. Uh, well, it takes the amount of how many transactions you already have plus one. <coughs> so it's literally like in Ethereum currently it's 15 seconds lower than what you're used to. Another thing that's probably worth mentioning is that because all this is going to arrive the traditional banking sector, it probably does not make sense to you to go for anything less than five dollars because the dump is actually going to end up net negative because like with all the taxes that are going on there, it probably won't make sense. Yeah. Do the dApps need to come to you to ask can we use line pay or is it just a question of I have a dApp and I download something and do like a web snippet thing and then all of a sudden my my dApp users can can now pay with, with fiat. Um, the future is the future answer is no currently you have to come to us but all the times so you're going to perform to do KYC. So although we'll be able to automate the, the post and allow you to just put in alright I'm going to do it that these are my like KYC information currently you have to communicate with us obviously MVP uh, but in the future this is going to be semi semi automated but all of this is probably always going to going to go to KYC and there it was. And yeah pretty much you see any yeah, yeah. I don't know if, if it's the right uh, time to ask but what about fees? And the fees are somewhat higher than what people are used to, which uh, we don't have like an upfront cost, we don't have some different cost. We have a commission between 4 and 5 percent. And all of this is pretty much because we are considered risky by the banks, therefore we are not given favorable rates at all. Because what? We are considered risky by the banks, like the transactions that we are doing by the private posters, therefore our rates are not favorable at all. So, okay, you have a transaction that basically comes transaction with a credit card and then you also have something reflected on blockchain. Do you have the ability to, so that money, can that be collected by an entity? Um, basically, let's say this $45 that was the transaction, yeah. would that go to the entity? Yes. As a partner, uh, minus I told you this is probably the best user experience that you can ever have because it's not MetaMask. You, don't, it, you should not care about whether you're on a browser or you're on a, um, a, I don't know, mobile phone or tablet or something like this. All of this is, a, uh, is achieved and actually we were asked so many times about this that we actually decided to integrate this in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a line pay, in the line pay. So uh, this is the end up wallets that we are, we are offering. It's a solution actually, it's not something that uh, uh, we do proprietary do. We pretty much, it's pretty much how my Ether wallet works. If some of you have used it, probably all of you. It pretty much div divides your, uh, your wallet into two f a file in a that is backed by a password that's known by the user. So what we do is we allow the DAP to actually like 
save the encrypted wallet file of the user, and whatever is the point of purchase, the point of interaction, allow them to serve it. Only user in the client side is able to, to um, decrypt it and unlock this wallet through their password. We have some things with um, forgotten passwords because a lot of uh, a lot of users tends to forget their passwords. So this is uh, another thing that we want to that we that we provide to the DApps. So in essence, although we most of what we do is like payment stuff, what we aim to be in the future is a complete UX solution for for DApps. So you're going to see us like in addition to payment stuff, you're going to see us like providing such uh, UX and adoption capabilities to to DApps. And we truly believe that in the next couple of years, we can become even the de facto solution of how interaction is actually performed into a DApp. So yeah, pretty much this is it for me. You are. If you're in focused at the moment, how, how difficult would, would it be for you guys to, let's say, diversify to uh, EOS or uh, Tezos or you know, one, of the other, one of the other platforms, Eternity, for example? How difficult would that be for you guys to do what you're doing now for Ethereum on the other, the other chains? <coughs> Build our platform with this in mind. So our platform is already prepared for something like this. We have requirements towards the network, which is the meta transactions things. Therefore, you need to be able to do uh, signature recovery into the smart contracts and to have like uh, the ability to, to, to use it. So once this is there, and as far as I know, this is going to be soon in eternity, we'll be able to very... The only thing that differs between the different, uh, the different networks is this meta transactions contract. And if we are able to write a meta transactions contract, which by the way is open source, you can see it in GitHub slash LimePay contracts, I think. Uh, you can pretty much, everything is there. It's like, I don't know, 30 lines of uh, smart contract. It's not too complicated. So yeah, we are very prepared to move to, to other networks. Okay. Moving. Yeah. So user submits a signed transaction, DAP submits a signed message. This is the handshake that we are actually platform for. When this is done, we execute the crypto evidence and charge the, charge the card and profit. The user receives the service or the product, the DAP receives then the fiat. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I would never advise any DAP to not allow their users to. Yeah. They are. Uh, they submit a signed transaction, but not broadcast it. This is a transaction that is signed by a user that cannot uh, render themselves this service because they have, don't have the funds. They don't have, so neither, neither the, the DAP owners or the user can provide them is what you're saying. The user has the, their own private key, the DAP has their own private key. Okay, that, that was the question. So you have two keys. Yes, uh, yes. There are two different sets of cryptographical evidence that yeah. we require from both parties that are in essence saying, No, we are just doing one EC recovery and one broadcasting of a transaction. So yeah, pretty much this is it. Any more questions, guys? Thank you. So, yeah. What you guys are doing is like amazing. 
what do I need to do to get you guys to say, okay, um, I can use your uh, line pay in my data? Like, what's the, like, the, the process? Are you, are you offering a uh, service or a product in your data? So, for example, if, if I have a DAP, I think that the idea of having like a, a fiat like on ramp yeah. will make my DAP go from like five monthly users to five hundred thousand. Yeah. And I contact you guys. Like, is yeah. it like a one week process? Is it a one year process? Um, do we have to pay you like a front? Like, what's the kind of like onboarding process for for using OnePay? The technical integration takes between a day and two maximum. Depends on how like how many things you like in your like server level in your front end. You have problems there, uh, and so uh, the, the legal can take probably up to a week to do the KYC, depending on how like nested the ownership you have over your uh, legal entity. So I'd say max the taxi is a uh, is a week. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.